Okay, so welcome everyone to the seventh lecture of CVS by Dr. Haideri for step, for step one. Thank you so much for joining the lecture. Hope you guys are doing well. If you guys can hear my voice, can I get a yes in the chat box, please? Yes, okay, good. Thank you so much. Can everyone else hear my voice? Yes or no? Okay, good. Uh, thank you so much for joining the class. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, while we wait for the other students to come and join the class, can we do a quick couple of questions from Amboss? Yes or no? What do you guys say? Can we do 10 questions from Amboss? Okay, so while we wait for the other students to come and join, let's complete 10 questions from Amboss and um, let's see where we go. Okay. So have you guys been able to revise your text? Yes or no? Yes, okay, good. So today we are going to do 10 more questions from CVS Pathology right now. And uh, after we do this, we will jump into our lecture for first aid and try to finish CVS as much as possible. Okay, so please get ready with your pen and a paper and write down the answers on the sheet and uh, we will cross check after we are done with solving the 10 questions. Okay, so just give me one second over here. Okay, can everyone see my screen properly? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Starting with questions, yes. We are starting with only 10 questions uh, while we wait for the other students to come and join the class. In the meantime, let's make the best use of the time and uh, let's do 10 questions and then let's start the lecture. Okay, is everyone ready? Yes or no? Can I get some quick answers, please? Hey, Dr. Jorge, Dr. Fidel, Dr. V, anyone else? Okay, good. So as usual, you guys will get exactly one minute and 30 seconds for each question. And then after that, I'll move forward to the next question. And after we finish the 10 questions, we will discuss the question then then move forward to the lecture. So let's begin.
Okay, your time is up. Is everyone done? Yes or no? Your time is up. Is everyone done with the questions? Okay. Do you guys want to see the ECG of the last of, of the last question? Do I enhance the ECG? This one. Look. Okay. Are we clear? So let's begin with the first question. Okay. Are we ready to solve the question? Is everyone ready? Guys, are we ready? Shall we begin? Okay. So let's let's begin with the first question. Which of the following sets of hemodynamic changes is most likely present in this patient? So which one did you guys choose for your answer? Excuse me. 65 year old woman, one month history of progressive shortness of breath, diabetes, temperature, heart rate, blood pressure is this. Cardiopulmonary examination shows an S3 gallops and coarse crackles. These, this is a sign of heart failure. Yes or no? Okay. Which one did you guys choose? So we have B and C. The answer for this one is B. Very good. Okay. Because this patient has sign symptoms of heart failure, especially systolic heart failure. So the patient has. Uh, left-sided heart failure for which, what should be the left ventricular output, the cardiac output for a left ventricular failure? Should it be high or should it be low? Fast answers, please. The cardiac output. Can I get some fast feedback from you guys, please? Thank you so much. Low, very good. What would happen to the resistance in the lungs? There, there would be backflow of blood as a, as a result. The resistance will be increased, very good. If the cardiac output is low, should there be more stretching of the bare receptor or less stretching of the bare receptor? Fast answers, please. Should there be less stretching or more stretching of the bare receptor? Less stretching, very good. As a result, should there be sympathetic innervation or parasympathetic innervation? Fast answers, please. There should be sympathetic, very good. Sympathetic, as a result, total peripheral resistance is high. Okay, total peripheral resistance is high. And next one is the venous oxygen content is going to be low. Why? Because the blood flow from the heart is decreased. I mean, the cardiac output is decreased. As a result, less blood is available to reach the tissues and organs, and less blood is available to um, carry the oxygen to the different uh, tissues in the body. As a result, the veins will also carry low amount of oxygen. So in most cases, the mixed venous oxygen content will be low. Did we understand this question? Yes or no? Everyone, did we understand this question? No. Which one did you guys choose for this answer? Cardiac workup prior to the patient's death would most likely show which of the following findings. Which one did you guys choose? Very good. The answer for this one is A, right? Very good. Because A is for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Everyone who chose E, I'm going to tell you why this is wrong. Because in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy yesterday, do you remember? I repeated the word asymmetric thickening, asymmetric, not symmetric. Do you guys remember? I, I was repeating this time and time again. And you guys got tested on this. Look, in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, what do we have over here? If this is the left ventricle, right? If this is the left ventricle, this is the interventricular septum, and this is the mitral valve. Isn't there an asymmetric thickening of the interventricular septum? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. There is an asymmetric thickening of the interventricular septum, and that pulls the mitral valve this way. As a result, we have mitral regurgitation, and this output of blood from the left ventricle this is blocked, so the blood cannot go out. So what do we have? Do we have symmetric thickening or asymmetric thickening? Fast answers, please. We have symmetric or asymmetric thickening. 
asymmetric thickening. So please do not make this mistake again in the future. And the motion of the mitral valve, will it be anterior? Yes or no? Will there be an anterior motion of the mitral valve? Yes or no, fast answers, please. Yes, okay. Did you guys understand the mistake? Did you guys understand your mistake? Yes, okay, good. Uh, can I get the attention of Dr. Dahlia Ahmed over here very quickly? Dr. Dahlia Ahmed, can you hear my voice? Yes. Yes, uh, we sent you an email yesterday, most probably. Can you uh -huh. please uh, check the email and get back to us as soon as possible? Okay. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. Um, which one did you guys choose for this answer, number three? Last answers, please. Sixty-five-year-old woman comes to the physician for a three-month history of intermittent palpitation. CPR shows no abnormality. ECG shows an absence of P wave. Which one? Did, which one did you guys choose? Absent P wave and irregular RR intervals. What does this mean? The difference between the atrial and ventricular rates in this patient is most likely due to which of the following? Very good. Okay, this is your, this is, this is your um, diagnostic for atrial fibrillation. Everyone who taught atrial fibrillation, absolutely wonderful because do you remember your, uh, when we were discussing ECG, I told you that in, that in the normal ECG, right? The P wave is going to be absent in atrial fibrillation, right? So whenever you get an ECG finding where, say, where they say that the P waves are not there and the RR intervals are irregular, this is a, this is a uh, finding of uh, an atrial fibrillation. So that's that, okay? So what happens in atrial fibrillation? The difference between atrial and ventricular rates in this patient is most likely due to which of the following? <clears throat> Always remember that in atrial fibrillation, what happens is over here, we know that the, we know that in the heart, we have the SA node, then we have the AV node, right? And in between SA node and AV node, which one is the rate slowing node? Fast answer speed. The answer for that one is AV node. Yes, that AV node is the rate slowing uh, node. If the AV node cannot slow down the rate of the SA nodal activity, right? Temporary inactivation of the sodium channels in AV node. If the SA, if the AV node cannot slow down the rate, can we have hyperactivity of the SA node? Yes or no? Okay, look, so over here, look, try to understand the question. The question is the difference between atrial and ventricular rates in this patient is most likely due to which of the following. So over here, the beat, look at the beat. And the beat is 95 beats per minute. Okay, the beat is 95 beats per minute. What is the normal heart rate? Isn't the normal heart rate 60 to 90 beats per minute? Yes or no? Yes, okay. The question was, why is there a difference in between the atrial rate and the ventricular rate? The atrial rate, as they said, has an absence of P wave and irregular RR intervals. So shouldn't the atrial rate be higher than 95 beats per minute? Yes or no? The atrial rate is higher than the ventricular rate, but the SA node, which is undergoing atrial fibrillation, is it transmitting a lot of impulses to the AV node? Yes or no? Is it transmitting a lot of impulses to the AV node that is undergoing atrial fibrillation? Yes. Yes or no? Yes, yeah, right? But what, the question is, why isn't the ventricles contracting at the same rate as the atrias? Okay, the, the question is, why is the ventricles not contracting at the same rate as the atria? That is because the AV node has a rate slowing activity. Okay, there is a temporary inactivation of the sodium channels in the AV node. As a result, there is a rate slowing activity. So that is the answer to that question. Okay, this, this question is actually very easy, but the way that they have structured the last line of the question makes this somewhat 
difficult. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Okay. Have I made myself clear? Okay. Can I get the attention of Dr. Fidel very quickly? Dr. Fidel. Yes. Would you be kind enough to unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you explain what this question is asking about? Um, it's the difference between the AB node and SA node and AB node. Um, okay. SA node goes with the, yeah, it goes with the uh, specific um, rate of pulse and should AB node uh, slower or lower that uh, pulse uh, in this case, AB node don't work well. So um, it will transmit the same speed of SA node to the rest of the heart muscle. Right. So basically, so basically, are you telling me that the question is asking you, why is the atria contracting at a higher beat per minute? And why is the ventricle contracting at a lower beat? So to answer this, uh, the, to, to, to answer this, the reason being is because when the SA node, as you have just said, it fires and it transmits a lot of impulse to the AV node, are you saying that the AV node is responsible for slowing down the SA node, yes or no? Yes. Okay, good, very good. Thank you so much. So let's think about SA node and AV node as two brothers. SA node is the, is the small brother or the smaller sibling. The AV node is the bigger sibling. You know like how the big siblings, they always advise the small siblings to go slow, yes or no? to not party too much, to not get into trouble too much, try to guide them to the right path. Yes, so something very similar. The SA node always wants to party, always wants to uh, lose control, get into trouble and everything else during atrial fibrillation. And the AV node is responsible for stopping that. Okay, let's move forward to the next question. Which one did you guys choose over here? Which one did you guys choose? History of shortness of breath. He has no history of serious illness. Left heart catheterization is normal. Graph represents the results of the catheterization. The intensity of the patient's cardiac murmur is most likely to be greatest over which of the following? The answer for this one is B. Very good. Okay. So over here, what, what does this tell you? A 62-year-old man has progressive shortness of breath during exercise and episodic chest pain. Uh, left heart catheterization is performed. A graph represents the results of the catheterization. Over here, the intensity of the spacious murmur is most likely by which of the following. If we look at the graph, then what do we see over here? When we look at the graph, we see that there is over here, what do we see? That over here, we see that there is a problem with the opening of the aortic valve, yes or no? Because of the delayed opening of the aortic valve, there's a delay in the, uh, there's basically a delay in the uh, exit of the blood the ventricle outside into the system of circulation. So, and if it's a 62 year old man who has progressive shortness of breath and episodic chest pain, and over here, if the vital signs are normal and everything else, then what should be your answer for this patient? The answer for this one should be aortic stenosis. And what sort of aortic stenosis is this? Is it due to rheumatic fever or is it due to old age and senility? This is due to old age and senile. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. This is how the aortic stenosis would look, look like. Do you guys want me to talk about the graph or do you guys remember the graph from our discussion? Do, do you guys remember the graph? Yes or no? Do you guys remember the graph from our discussion? You do not remember the graph from our, from our discussion, from physiology? Who remembers the graph from the, uh, the, the cardiac physiology, which we studied? Okay. So we'll, we'll, we will discuss this again over here after the end of the lecture today to make sure that we remember the graph easily. Let's move forward to the next question. Which one did you guys choose over here? Fast answers, please.
Like, which one did you guys choose over here? Fast answers, please. Twenty-five-year-old man, fatigue. He has been to the ER several times for recurrent shoulder and patellar dislocation, abnormal giant joint and skin hypermobility, high frequency. It's heard. What do you think the diagnosis is for this patient, Doctor? Let's ask this question to Doctor Sanjeev Choudhury. Would you be kind enough to tell us uh, what the diagnosis of this patient is in the chat box? This patient. The answer, uh, the question for Dr. Chaudhary. This is Martins. Okay, very good. Okay, mitral valve prolapse. Which one did you guys choose over here? Past answers, please. Which of the following is the likely result of an earlier onset of the patient's auscultation os finding? Which one did you guys choose? Very good. The answer for this one is abrupt standing. Do you remember that any murmur that decreases blood flow to the heart will increase the murmur of mitral valve prolapse and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? Do you guys remember that? Yes or no? Any, any, any maneuver that decreases blood flow to the heart will increase the murmur of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and mitral valve prolapse. Over here, if you stand abruptly, will all the blood go to the peripheral uh, blood vessels? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Are we clear about this? Everyone, are we clear about this question? Which one did you guys choose over here? 55 year old man comes to the ER because of left sided chest pain and difficulty breathing. Which one did you guys choose? <clears throat> okay, very good. So there's an ST elevation in one AVL and V5 to V6. What does this mean? One AVL to V5 to V6. This patient has a lateral MI, yes or no? One AVL is yesterday, do you remember in our ECG, we talked about how two, three AVF is for right coronary artery. One AVL is for left circumflex artery. So over here, the answer for this one is that this patient most probably has uh, an infarction in the left circumflex artery and the blood supply of the heart is that for the left coronary artery, we have the formations of the left circumflex and the left anterior descending. So that's how the catheter will pass. We'll pass the catheter to the left coronary artery, to the left circumflex artery. Are we clear? Yes or no? Can we move on to the next question? Okay. Which one did you guys choose over here? Microscopic examination of the nail lesion is most likely to show which of the following. This is a patient of what? This is a patient of? Infective endocarditis, very good. So what will it show over here? What does these black lines represent? These black lines, what do they represent? Okay. These black lines, they represent splinter hemorrhage or microemboli. Okay, let me just talk about this for one second. Do I have everyone's attention? Yes or no? Do I have everyone's attention? Okay. Look at the diagram over here. Look at the diagram. This is the heart, right? And these are your valves, mitral valve, tricuspid valve, right? This is the pulmonary blood vessel. This is the aortic blood vessel. Over here, you have the pulmonic valve. You have the aortic valve. In infective endocarditis, do we have bacterial growth in the valves? Yes or no? Do we have bacterial growth in the valves? Yes. The answer why is because the valves are lined by endocardium. Yes. So we have bacterial growths in the valves, especially different sorts of gram-negative bacteria, Hasek group of organisms, Virgin's group of streptococci, and these types of organisms. So when blood flows over here, right, blood comes to the right atria, and then blood goes to the right ventricle, then it goes 
to the lungs. Then it comes back over here to the left atrium, to the left ventricle. Then it goes to the system in circulation. With the high flow of blood that's coming back to the left atrium and to the left ventricle, isn't there a possibility that small amount of vegetations can break from the valve and with the, uh, and with the blood, they can be carried into the system in circulation? Fast answers, please. Yes or no? The answer is yes. When these small amount of micro em emboli or micro embolic vegetations of the bacteria, when they're carried by the blood into the system in circulation, they go to different parts of the body and they start depositing. When they deposit over here in the nails, when they deposit in the nails, we call this splinter hemorrhage, right? Then when they deposit in the palms and soles, what do we call them? In the palms and soles, we call them. Can, it, can anyone tell me what, what, uh, do, what we call them? Janeway lesions or Osler's nodes, which one? <clears throat> Janeway lesions or Osler nodes, which one? Okay, can they deposit in uh, the renal system, yes or no? The, the embolize, the answer is yes. Can they deposit in uh, the parenchyma of the brain, yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's that. So we'll talk about infective endocarditis. Uh, today and then we'll move forward okay so this is a microemboli that's the reason okay micro or microemboli uh, which of the following is the likely cause of these patient symptoms which one did you guys choose over here fast answers please which one did you guys choose All right. Okay, very good. This is your presentation for aortic dissection. Okay, for your aortic dissection, like this. In a CT scan, this is how the aortic dissection would look like. This is a break in the tunica intima. Let's move forward. Which one did you guys choose over here? Which one did you guys choose for this one for interactive endocarditis? This is. This is novo biosin sensitive coagulase negative cocci. Okay, so we'll talk about this. This represents what? Streptococcus uh, epidermidis. This does not represent Bearden's group of streptococci. This represents streptococcus epidermidis because the patient has a prosthetic heart valve. Okay, so we'll talk about this when we study microbiology, how to identify different sorts of organisms, different sorts of bacteria. But that is that. But are we aware that whenever we have a prosthetic uh, implant in our body, there is a formation of a film around that implant? For example, let's say that if the patient has a prosthetic catheter, right? Let's say that this is the catheter and this has been present in the, uh, the I mean, this has been present in the patient for a long period of time. Are we aware that there's a formation of a small biofilm around along the catheter and that biofilm along that catheter is formed due to the presence of streptococcus epidermidis. Okay, and this allows the bacteria to sort of grow on the catheter and get dismissed in the blood. Next one, which one did you guys choose over here? A drug is administered that inhibits the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel. The drug it administered most likely has which of the following effects on the conduction system? Which one did you guys choose? The answer is, okay. Prolongation of AV node repolarization. Do you remember that um, over here, if we choose, uh, if we give a calcium channel blocker, okay, but then, then what happens? If we give a calcium channel blockers, um, the depolarization, do you remember over here what happens? We have the, we had the funny channels, right? And then all of a sudden we have the opening of the sodium and the calcium channels. And then what happened? The sodium calcium channels closed. And then we have the um, opening of the potassium channels and which results in your um, 
which results in your uh, repolarization. So over here, there is another one where uh, if we give a patient a non-dihydropyridine calcium channels, then what would happen? If we block the calcium channels, wouldn't there be a long time that the nodes will take to depolarize? Yes or no? Wouldn't it take a long time for the nodes to depolarize? Yes. As a result, will depolarization be delayed? The answer is yes. If depolarization is delayed, what would happen to repolarization? Repolarization would also be delayed. As a result, what happens? Does the um, cardiac, I mean, does the arrhythmia have enough time to uh, get fixed? Yes or no? Because in arrhythmia, we have what? We have tachycardia, right? So now if we are blocking a calcium channel, then the opening of the calcium channel is closed. As a result, depolarization is delayed and repolarization is delayed. And then we have the normalization of the EKG finding. Yes? Did, did you understand, everyone? Okay, good. So that's that for today. Uh, that's, I mean, that's all, uh, that's all for the questions for now. We will do some more questions after the end of the lecture. So for now, can we go back to our lecture, yes or no? Yes, can we go back to our lecture? Did you guys do your homework for reading the cardiomyopathies like how we discussed yesterday? Yes. Okay, just give me one second. Okay, so uh, one more time, my apologies. Did you get some time to read the cardiomyopathies according to our homework, yes or no? Okay, so can I quiz you guys over here very quickly on cardiomyopathies and see if you understood? Okay, is everyone ready for the questions? Let's begin. So first question over here for Dr. Nazareth. Would you be kind enough to tell us how many types of cardiomyopathy do we have? Very good. Next one for Dr. Jorge Otero. What are the common causes of dilated cardiomyopathy? Hello, doctor. Yes, hi. What are the common causes of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy? Yeah, it will be uh, alcohol abuse and Very good. some infections. Alcohol abuse and? Cocaine also. Abuse. Alcohol abuse and cocaine, absolutely wonderful. These are the two most highest yield causes of DCM in US. Then next, we have what? Uh, we have also Chagas disease. We have also- Very good. Uh -huh. That is okay. like Latin countries. Very good, okay. okay. So uh, to sum up, dilated cardiomyopathy causes are drugs and bugs. What are the drugs? Alcohol, cocaine. What are the bugs? We have Trypanosoma cruzi, Coxsackie virus, right? And then we have some uh, systemic diseases, like for example, hemochromatosis, sarcoidosis. Yes or no? These are the causes of DCM. Okay. Uh, next question over here for Dr. Tasneem. Dr. Zain Tasneem, would you be kind enough to tell us what is the number one reason for having hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? Um, uh, uh, 
there is a mutation in genes that codes for the sarcomeric protein, uh, uh, mostly the myosin binding protein C and uh, beta myosin heavy chain. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, so that is the exact reason for having hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy because we have an autosomal dominant defect in the sarcomere protein resulting in a false protein formation of um, your myosin binding protein Z and beta myosin heavy chain. Okay. Next one is for Dr. Fidel. Uh, what are the causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy? Um, it's a... Um... Didn't, to be honest, I didn't review the, the myocarditis, but uh, I would say is they believe. Uh, the okay, no problem. Protein. Let me help you out. Let me help you with okay. the thought process. Okay. All right. So restrictive cardiomyopathy is what a disease where the heart cannot contract or dilate. Yes or no? Because there's there is some sort of a yeah fibrosis. Brain. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So if we think about fibrosis, let's let's think about some of the diseases that will promote fibrosis. Uh, if there's a lot of iron in the body, will there be problem? Yes or no? With uh, Okay, so number one is, let's say hemochromatosis, okay? Next one, if there's a patient who has had an experience of radiation, can radiation cause fibrosis? Yes, as you believe. Okay, so radiation fibrosis, number two. Number three, can you tell me an, another cause where we have any chronic disease, we have the formation of abnormal proteins in the body and they deposit around the heart? This disease is called amyloidosis, yes or no? Dr. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, amyloidosis, uh, very good. Can we talk? I believe. Very good. Sarcoidosis is another disease where what do we have? We have the formation of different sorts of granulomas, non caseating granulomas, and they deposit in different portions of the body, including the heart. Yes? Okay, so That's right. very good. So these are some of the high yield, highest yield causes. So to sum up, we have hemochromatosis, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, fibrosis endocardial fibroelastosis and all the osses okay okay are we clear okay perfect thank you so much so now let's begin with uh, heart failure okay thank you so much for doing your homework i'm really really happy and really proud of you guys let's begin with heart failure so let's talk about heart failure and um, this this is this is only going to be a revision for most of you since most of us over here are already uh, graduates or licensed physicians. Yes, we are already licensed physicians. So we should have a very good idea, or even if so, we should have a very vague uh, uh, or somewhat of an idea of what a heart failure truly is. So let's talk about heart failure. We didn't finish ECG tracing. Yes, I know, I'm gonna talk about ECG tracing. No, don't worry. Okay, are we ready to start talking about heart failure? Yes. No. So what is heart failure? Heart failure is basically when there is failure of contraction of either the left ventricle or there's failure of contraction of the right ventricle. Yes or no? Then if there is failure of contraction, then what do we call this? We call this a systolic heart failure. That is the heart cannot pump the blood out. Yes or no? Because either the left ventricle is non-functioning or the left ventricle has been so thickened that it cannot push the blood out, number one. Number two is, what if I tell you that there's another sort of an heart failure where the left ventricles, they're so lax, right? They are very lax. And if they're lax, then over here, can they stretch properly? Yes or no? The answer is? No, they cannot stretch properly. If they cannot stretch properly, can they contract back according to, to the Frank Sterling's law? Yes or no? The answer is no. As a result, do they have a problem with, um, do they have a problem with what? With getting the blood out? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So they have a problem with getting the blood out, meaning that they cannot contract properly, yes or no? They cannot contract properly. So if they cannot contract properly, is this a systolic heart failure or is, it, or is this a diastolic heart failure? The answer is, this is a systolic heart failure. And over here, the left ventricle, they can be very thickened in hypertension, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, anything that allows thickening of the ventricles. Can they relax, yes or no? The answer is no. 
So as a result, what sort of a heart failure is this? This is a diastolic heart failure. That is, they cannot relax properly. That's one type of, uh, uh, that's one type of difference in heart failure. How about I talk about another sort of difference of heart failure where we say either it's a left heart failure or if it's a right heart failure. If it's a left heart failure, what are some of the sign symptoms that the patients will have? For example, if, it, if, if this side of the heart is failing, right? If the left side of the heart, if they fail, if this fails, then will there be backup, backup of blood over here in the left atrium, yes or no? The answer is yes. Will this atrial blood back up into the lungs, yes or no? The answer is yes. So can we get, uh, can we get uh, pulmonary edema due to all the venous congestion and the aortic congestion? The answer is yes, okay? So that's that. So what sort of, uh, what sort of uh, sign symptoms will patients of left heart failure come with? Can the patient of left heart failure come with shortness of breath, yes or no? The answer is yes. Patients will come with shortness of breath. And the shortness of breath will be more when the patient is lying down. If the patient is lying down like this, isn't it easier for the blood to flow back because of decreased activity of gravity? The answer is yes. So, do you, so patients of uh, left heart failure, can they lie down in a supine position without using uh, one or two pillows? The answer is, the answer is no. Why? Because whenever they lie down, in a supine position, the blood flows easily back into the lungs and this causes severe congestion and it increases the shortness of breath. So patients will eat, will uh, will come to you with the red sign symptoms of what? Orthopnea. Have you guys heard of orthopnea? I'm sure you have. That is the shortness of breath, they increase when the patient is lying down. Can we um, also get paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Do you guys know what paroxysmal nocturnal, nocturnal dyspnea is? Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea is when the patient wakes up from the sleep, right? What happens? Whenever we wake up from our sleep, our heart basically is getting ready for the function. So there is a lot of venous return. There's increased venous, re venous return, right? But if in this patient, if the left, uh, if the left ventricle has failed, when we have a lot of venous return, will it increase the congestion in the lungs? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Why will it increase the congestion in the lungs? They will increase the congestion in the lungs because the left ventricle has failed and there's already backup of blood into the lungs. So it would increase venous return, the congestions will increase and shortness of breath will increase. So patients, can they have orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Another one is all the blood that goes back into the lungs, can they uh, cause pulmonary edema? Yes or no? Can they cause severe pulmonary edema? The answer is yes. And the blood, when it leaks out into the interstitial spaces, can the blood, uh, can the blood products be broken down by uh, macrophages? Yes or no? Can the blood products be broken down by macrophages? The answer is yes. When the blood products are broken down with macrophages, can we have deposit of iron inside the macrophage? Can we have iron deposition inside the macrophage? Yes or no? The answer is yes. As a result, what do we call these sort of uh, cells? We call them chemosiderin laden macrophages, or we call this heart failure cells. Are we clear? Yes or no? We either call them hemosiderin laden macrophages, or we call them heart failure cells. Okay. Now let's talk about let's talk about the right heart failure. So what are the signs symptoms of left heart failure? Can I get some fast answers, please? What are the signs symptoms of left heart failure? Orthopnea, very good. Then paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and <clears throat> edema. Okay, good. This is the right heart, left heart. In the right heart, if the right heart fails, then what happens? First and foremost, the number one cause of right heart failure is the right heart has to push the blood out to the lungs, yes or no? The, the right heart, they have to push the blood out into the lungs, okay? If the vessels of the lungs, right? If the blood vessels of the lungs, if they have a high resistance, 
then will the right ventricle have to work more or work less to push the blood out? Fast answer, please. The right, the right ventricle will have to work more. If they have to work more, then shouldn't there be right ventricular hypertrophy? Yes or no? The answer is yes, there will be right ventricular hypertrophy. And as a result, there could be failure of right ventricle over time. So what are the causes of increased pulmonary resistance? This could either be prim primary pulmonary arterial hypertension, this could either be left heart failure, or this can also be core pulmonary. Yes, long, long standing COPD and will cause pulmonary blood vessel vasoconstriction. And this will increase the resistance in the lungs. And the right heart will have to work more to push the blood out. As a result, there could be right ventricular failure. Now, can I give you guys a small? Uh, can I give you guys a small note on lungs off topic? Off topic, okay. This is this is off topic of CVS, okay. <clears throat> yes or no? Can I talk about lungs for one quick second? Can I get everyone's attention, please? Okay. It, always remember this. Always remember this. If there is a pathology in the lungs, for example, a tumor or COPD or asthma or fibrosis, whenever we have a pathology in the lungs, the portion of the lungs that are affected by the disease will have vasoconstriction. Have I made myself clear? The portion of the lungs where we have the pathology, there will be vasoconstriction. Do you know why? This is an innate mechanism, innate meaning inborn mechanism of the lungs, where the lungs are aware that if there is a pathology, the lungs are aware that there will not be oxygen um, filtering out from the arteries into the veins. So there will not be oxygen transfusion. Yes. So what the lung does is they divert the blood away from the, from the pathological site to the non-pathological site, that is this site. As a result, since they have to divert the blood away, the portion of the lungs that's affected by the pathology, will it undergo vasoconstriction or vasodilatation? Fast answer, please. They will undergo, they will undergo vasoconstriction. They will undergo vasoconstriction because, because this, portion of the lungs, there will be vasoconstriction. Why? Because the lungs are aware that there is absolutely no point in bringing the blood in this portion because oxygen exchange cannot happen over here. As a result, this portion of the lung will be vasoconstricted and this portion of the lung will be vasodilated so that the blood can flow to another portion where oxygen exchange can take place. Now, the question is, if there is a lot of pathology in the lungs, right? Long standing COPD, if there is a tumor for a long period of time, fibrosis for a long period of time, in those cases, will there be excessive vasoconstriction of the blood vessel? Yes or no? The answer is yes. As a result, what would happen to the uh, pulmonary resistance? Will it be high or will it be low? It will be? high, right? So can we say that long-standing lung diseases increases pulmonary vascular resistance? As a result, there's a possibility the right heart can fail. Yes or no? That's what we call as core pulmonary. Are we clear? Yes? Okay, now let's, let's talk about right heart failure. If there's a right heart failure, will blood back up into the right atrium? Yes or no? Will blood start backing up into the right atrium? The answer is yes. Will the, will the blood back up into the jugular veins? Yes or no? Oh, the answer is yes. Will there be edema in the dependent portions of the body, for example, in the legs? Yes or no? There will be leg edema, right? So there will be leg edema. So the, that's it. So what are the signs and symptoms of right heart failure? Oh, and another thing, will the blood back up into the liver or not? Yes or no? Will the blood back up into the liver? Yes. When the blood backs up into the liver, the same way how we had um, we had macrophages in the lungs that were forming the uh, hemocytin-laden macrophages, can we also have macrophage activity in the liver? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Right. As a result, we can also find heart. Uh, we can also find uh, macrophages, hemocytin-laden macrophages in the liver. Number one. Number two is: Will there be hepatic congestion? Yes or no? Will there be hepatic congestion? The answer is yes. And this hepatic congestion can result in ruptures of uh, the weak blood vessels. And as a result, can we get 
leakage of blood and deposition of iron in the liver resulting in, in, a, in a condition called nutmeg liver, yes or no? Iron deposition and, and blood congestion in the liver re resulting in the formation of nutmeg liver. Can we also call this type of liver cirrhosis as cardiac cirrhosis, yes or no? Cardiac cirrhosis. Okay, so that's that. So one more time, the sign symptoms of right heart failure, can they be uh, edema in the legs, especially peripheral edema? Then what else? Can we get jugular venous distension? The answer is yes. Can we get nutmeg liver or hepatic congestion? The answer is yes. Okay, are we clear everyone? Yes or no? Okay, now, uh, over here, if there is a patient, okay, uh, if, there is a, if there is a patient who has a diastolic, uh, my apologies, if there's a patient who has a systolic um, heart failure, if there's a patient who has systolic heart failure, I want to talk about S3 and S4 very quickly. Systolic heart failure means that there is excessive dilatation of the left ventricle for whatever reason. So in systolic uh, heart failure, the left ventricle cannot contract to, to uh, get the blood out. But since it's dilated, will it be easier for the blood to flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So this sudden rush of blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle will result in what sort of uh, extra heart sound, S3 or S4? The answer is this will result in an S3, okay? In a diastolic dysfunction, in a diastolic problem where we have excessive thickening of the left ventricle, right? If we have excessive thickening of the left ventricle, will the blood come and splatter on the left ventricle? Yes or no? Because of the thickening left ventricle, the answer is yes. As a result, what sort of heart sound should we guess? S3 or S4? The answer is S4. Okay. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, next one is, um, so drug-wise, what sort of drugs should we give? Should we give drugs that increases blood volume or should we give drugs that decreases blood volume? Fast answers, please. We should give drugs that decreases blood, that decreases blood volume. Dr. Nazareth, can you explain how decreased blood volume can help um, heart failure? Decrease of blood volume, how can that help in heart failure? <clears throat> is there anyone who can explain this? Okay. If the, if the heart is not being able to pump the blood out, do we need more, uh, do we need uh, basically more blood in the body or less blood in the body? The answer is we need less blood in the body, right? Because <clears throat> the heart is not being able to pump the blood out. As a result, we need to make sure that the blood volume is low. So that's, that's basically the reason, decreases the workload of the heart. Yes, very good. So that's that. So what sort of drugs should we give? Can we give ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers? Yes, okay. Can we also give diuretics? Yes or no? Right, we can also give diuretics, that's that. And if there is a, if there is a systolic dysfunction, can we give drugs that increases cardiac contractility? Yes or no? And can we give drugs that increases cardiac contractility? The answer is, the answer is yes. Okay. So that's that. We can give drugs that increases cardiac contractility. And uh, another question is, and another question is um, over here. <clears throat> Already there is a systolic function, right? Already over here, there is a systolic function, meaning that the ejection fraction in these patients, they are already low. So are you going to give a drug in systolic heart failure that increase, that decreases the um, activity of the heart? Yes or no? For example, in a systolic heart failure, are you going to give beta blockers or not? In systolic heart failure, the answer is no. Because in systolic heart failures, if you give beta blockers, then the force of contraction of the heart muscles, they are decreased. 
And uh, over here, the cardiac contractility will also be decreased. As a result, it will be difficult to get the blood out. So try to avoid giving beta blockers in systolic heart failure. Okay. In diastolic heart failure, more or less, beta blockers can be a little bit helpful because this will allow the left ventricles to relax and allow the left ventricles to fill up with blood. So we can consider giving beta blockers over here. Okay, are we clear everyone? Yes or no? Okay, good. Now, um, over here, let's talk about another thing. Okay, let's jump into the text and let's talk about the text over here very quickly. Is, it, is everyone ready, yes or no, with the text, with the textbook? Yes, okay, good. So what is heart failure? Heart failure is a clinical syndrome of cardiac pump dysfunction where patients have congestion and low perfusion. Okay, this is the pathology. What are the symptoms? Symptoms include dyspnea, orthopnea, fatigue, heart sounds and rails, jugular venous distension and pitting edema. This is for both right and left heart failure sign symptoms. Okay, both right and left heart failure sign symptoms. Where do you think these things will be present in your question or in your answer? Fast answers, please. They will be presented in your question. That is a patient comes to you with dyspnea, orthopnea, S3 sound, jugular venous distension and this, and you have to diagnose what the disease is. Over here, we have two types of problems. Number one is a systolic dysfunction. Number two is a diastolic dysfunction. Systolic dysfunction means that over here, the heart has no problem. Um, I, I mean, the heart has no problem with relaxing. The heart has a problem with contracting, yes or no? So if the heart has a, has a problem with contracting, the ejection fraction, is it going to be low or is it going to be high? The answer is, if the heart cannot contract properly, the ejection fraction is going to be low, very good. And end diastolic volume is going to be high because over here, they have more time for uh, relaxation. So end diastolic volume is going to be high and contractility is going to be low. This is, for example, in dilated cardiomyopathy, we get a systolic heart failure. In diastolic heart failure or in a diastolic dysfunction, the heart has no problem with contracting, but the heart has a problem with relaxation. So this could be due to any sort of uh, condition of the heart where we have hypertrophy of the cardiac muscles. Yeah, yes. So the ejection fraction is preserved, but the compliance is decreased. What do we mean by the word compliance? Compliance basically means, over here, compliance basically means that the heart is not being able to stretch properly, okay? The heart is not being able to stretch properly. So when, whenever we use the word compliance for cardiac, diseases or for cardiac physiology or for pulmonology, always remember, always uh, think about stretch. The more stretching <clears throat> an, an organ can go through, the, the compliance is going to be high. Are we clear? Yes or no? The more stretching, the comp the more stretching an organ can go through, the compliance is going to be high. So in a diastolic dysfunction, the heart cannot relax properly. What do you think about the comp compliance? Should it be high or should it be low? This should be this should be high or low. The compliance is going to be low, very good. And there will be an increase of end diastolic pressure, okay? Increase of end diastolic pressure. Because the pressure of the end diastole is going to be high because all the blood is accumulating in the, in the left ventricle and they cannot stretch the left ventricle out. As a result, end diastolic pressure is going to be high. It's often due to uh, myocardial infarction. EDV, EDV is end diastolic volume, which is going to be normal or low. Okay, low or normal, are we clear? Okay, normal, or you can write down low. <clears throat> okay, now next one, right heart failure is most often due to left heart failure and poor pulmonary results, uh, refers to isolated right heart failure due to pulmonary cause. So we discussed this, right? <clears throat> because if there's a pathology of the lungs, then we get uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction that increases the pulmonary artery resistance. And as a result, the right heart has to work more to push the blood out. So a right heart failure due to lung disease is called core pulmonary, that's that. What are the drugs that we will give? AC inhibitors, beta blockers, uh, and, uh, except not in acute decompensated heart failure. That is, we will not give 
beta blockers for systolic heart failure. No beta blockers over here. Okay, please keep that in mind. Loop diuretics can be given and hydralazine with nitrate therapy can be given because it decreases preload. Yes, hydralazine will decrease preload. Okay. Uh, for right heart failure, should we give increased IV fluid or for left heart failure, should we give increased IV fluid? Fast answers, please. IV fluid should be increased for right heart or for left heart? Which one? IV fluid for right heart or for left heart? Which one? <clears throat> Absolutely. If there is a patient who has left heart failure and if you give them IV fluid, are you going to worsen the pulmonary congestion? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So you will avoid giving IV fluid for left heart failure, but for right heart failure, in order to increase the stretching of the right ventricle, are you going to increase the IV fluid? The answer is yes. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Now, signs and symptoms of left and right heart failure, we have already discussed this. Left heart failure is orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and pulmonary edema. Over here, the pathologies are extremely important. These pathologies will be presented in your answers. They will describe one of the symptoms and then they will ask you, why do we get orthopnea? Why do we get paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea? And since, since we have already discussed this, I'm not gonna go into the details, but every line over here is an answer. So please try to remember them. This is your homework for today. Homework is tomorrow. I'm gonna ask you, what, is, what are the pathologies, okay? Right heart failure symptoms are he uh, hepatomegaly, jugular venous distension, and peripheral edema. Okay, are we clear, yes or no? Okay, good. Now, let's talk about this chart over here very quickly. In heart failure, do we have increased cardiac output or decreased cardiac output? The answer is cardiac output is decreased. If cardiac output is decreased, the amount of blood that's going to the renal system, is it high or is it low? The amount of blood that's going to the renal system, it's low. So the juxta glomerular apparatus and the macula densa, especially the macula densa, will it sense low sodium or will it sense high sodium and water? Low sodium or high sodium with low blood flow? Low sodium, very good. Whenever it senses low sodium, is it going to advise the juxta glomerular apparatus to release more renin, yes or no? The answer is yes. Whenever renin is released, we have activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And then we have the release of angiotensin. And angiotensin will do what? First of all, it will increase uh, the activity of aldosterone and in increase circulating volume uh, with the help of uh, also a release of ADA that will increase the circulating volume. And angiotensin will also increase vasoconstriction. If there's vasoconstriction, uh, for example, in a patient who has decreased cardiac output, if there's vasoconstriction, can the blood pressure be maintained, yes or no? Because the heart already has a difficulty in getting the blood out. If there's some amount of vasoconstriction, then blood pressure can be maintained or the patient, or the patient will get hypotensive, yes or no? <clears throat> Another one is, Decreased cardiac output will, will result in increased sympathetic activity or decreased sympathetic activity? The answer is increase, decreased cardiac output will, will result in decreased stretching of the bare receptor. As a result, there will be decreased sympathetic activity and increased sympathetic activity. As a result, patients will have increased release of catecholamines and catecholamines, for example, when they come and they bind to the beta-1 receptor, they'll increase the heart rate and the contractility and alpha-1 receptor binding will result in vasoconstriction that will maintain your blood pressure so that you do not get hypotensive or so that you do not go into cardiogenic shock, okay? So that's that. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. Do you guys know the term cardiac remodeling? Do you guys know the term cardiac remodeling? Do you know what that means? Basically, cardiac remodeling means that Whenever the heart cannot function properly, due to the high stress that the muscles of the heart go through, the heart can have a disruption of its anatomical structure. Anatomical structure, right? So whenever we have a disruption of the anatomical structure of the heart in the presence of heart failure due to high blood volume, this phenomenon is called cardiac remodeling. So is this good or is this bad for us? Plus, please. The answer is, Cardiac remodeling is good or bad for us? 
Not good. Very good. Cardiac remodeling is not good. Can you tell me one drug that we gave in heart failure to prevent cardiac remodeling? <clears throat> no. <clears throat> Very good. The answer is ACE inhibitors. Always remember this. ACE inhibitors. Okay. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, good. Now, the next thing that I'll talk about is one of the most highest yield things that we will discuss. That is our discussion for shock. Is everyone ready? <clears throat> okay, let me just make a quick table over here. Okay. Are the graphs important, the pictures? Not really, not as much. These ones, no, not really. But let's, if you wanna talk about this over here, um, there are two types of graphs that we will see. I'm gonna use my blue pen for this because it's not very high yield. But there are two types of graphs that we will see if we do a pressure volume loop. This line, this line, right? Over here represents compliance. This line represents compliance. So if we have um, uh, if we have this sort of a graph where the compliance is normal, where the normal where there is normal compliance, is this a systolic problem or a diastolic problem? Fast answers, please. Where the compliance is okay, <clears throat> it's a systolic problem, meaning that over here. It's a systolic problem or a diastolic problem? My apologies. It's 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 over here. Uh, if the compliance is okay, meaning that over here the compliance is okay, meaning that the heart has no problem with stretching. The heart has no problem with stretching. The heart can stretch, but can the heart contract? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. The answer is no. Over here, so you guys are actually incorrect. This is not a systolic heart failure. This is a diastolic dysfunction, diastolic problem, meaning that <clears throat> over here, the heart has, um, wait, my apologies. You give me one second, give me one second, okay. Okay. No, you, you guys are correct. I, I apologize, my apologies. This is a systolic heart failure. The heart has a problem with contracting and getting the blood out. No, you, you are correct, I am wrong, my apologies. Okay, you are correct. Over here, if the compliance is decreased, then is this a systolic dysfunction or a diastolic dysfunction? That's answer, please. Diastolic dysfunction, okay? So how do we make the diagnosis? Next time when we see a graph like this, can we just see the compliance, yes or no? If the compliance is decreased, right? If the, if the compliance is the same, then it's a systolic problem. If the compliance is decreased, then it's a diastolic problem. Okay, are we clear, yes or no? Okay. Okay, one second. Okay, so we're gonna start talking about shocks, different types of shocks in the body. Now, what is shock? <clears throat> uh, my apologies, okay. So now what is shock? What is shock? Now, the number one, concept behind your understanding of shock is that shock is any phenomenon that results in decreased tissue perfusion. Have I made myself clear? Any phenomenon that results in decreased tissue perfusion, a perfusion means blood flow. As a result, there is decreased supply of oxygen and decreased supply of nutrients to the Tissues. As a result, can we get tissue damage? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. And can this be life threatening? Yes or no? Can this be life threatening? The answer is yes. This can also be life threatening, right? 
So how many types of shock do we have? We basically have three types of shock. Hypovolemic, when the total blood volume in our body is decreased, then we can have uh, decreased blood available to go to the tissues. That's number one. Next one, next one is cardiogenic. What is cardiogenic? Cardiogenic shock is where the heart is not being able to pump the blood properly. As a result, blood is not reaching the tissues. Next one is obstructive. What is an obstructive shock? Obstructive shock is basically where there is an obstruction. There is no problem with the heart muscle contraction, but the heart cannot function properly due to a secondary obstruction. For example, what sort of obstruction? There could be pulmonary embolism, there could be a tamponade, there could be excessive compression of the, of the heart by the lungs in tension pneumothorax, right? So that's that. Another one is distributive shock. What is distributive shock? Distributive shock is basically any phenomenon where we have excessive vasodilatation and uh, where the peripheral resistance of the body decreases severely. And if that happens, do we have loss of tone, loss of vascular tone, yes or no? The answer is yes. If vascular tone is absent, then can the blood reach different organs, yes or no? Because the blood vessels, they will stop contracting. So the blood, so the blood will not reach the tissues, right? What sort, of, uh, what sort of conditions can result in distributive shock? For example, can sepsis or anaphylaxis cause distributive shock, widespread vasodilatation? The answer is yes, okay? So these are the concepts. So over here, let's talk about the different phenomena that will happen in shock. So first of all, we'll, we will name the shock. We will talk about the etiology of the shock. Then we will talk about how the skin looks like in a patient with a different source of shock. Then we will talk about preload. Then we will talk about cardiac output. And then we will talk about afterload. Okay. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay. Is everyone ready? Okay. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. First, first one is if there's a patient of hypovolemic shock, hypovolemic shock then what does this mean? That they have lost the blood volume? Yes or no? So they lose their blood volume how? Either by excessive vomiting or diarrhea or blood loss, hemorrhage. Yes, hemorrhage. Or what else? Patients can also be dehydrated. Very good, dehydration. So how will, uh, as a result, what would happen in these conditions Okay, in, this, in these conditions, the blood volume is low. If the blood volume is low, then will there be more stretching of the bare receptor or less stretching of the bare receptor? Fast answer, please. There will be less stretching. As a result, should we have sympathetic activity or parasympathetic activity? Sympathetic activity. In sympathetic activity, do we have peripheral vasoconstriction or vasodilatation? Vasoconstriction. If the peripheral blood vessels are vasoconstricted, can the skin lose its, its can the skin get rid of heat in the body? Yes or no? The answer is no. So in a vasoconstricted uh, skin, will it be cold or will it be warm? Fast answer, please. It will be cold, very good. Okay, it will be cold. The skin will be cold. What would happen to the preload if we lose blood volume? Would it be high or would it be low? Very good. Preload is going to be low. Cardiac output, will it be high or will it be low? Cardiac output is going to be low. The sympathetic innervation will increase vasoconstriction. And as a result, we will have increase of total peripheral resistance. So afterload is going to be high or low? Afterload is going to be high. Okay, good. Next one is cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock. If you have a patient with cardiogenic shock, that must mean that the heart is not being able to pump the blood out. Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. So what are the causes of cardiogenic shock? This could be myocardial infarction, heart failure. Then what else? cardiomyopathy, right? Valvular problem, for example, aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation, these types of problem and arrhythmias, multiple issues. 
So same thing, if the heart cannot pump the blood out, will there be less stretching of the barrier receptor or more stretching? There will be less stretching. As a result, there will be sympathetic innervation and this will be a cold, clammy skin. Once again, preload, cardiogenic shock, the blood is uh, pulling up, right? The blood is basically pulled up. So as a result, preload that the blood uh, is coming back to the heart, it could either be high or it would either be low. It doesn't, it, it, it's not uh, very sure. But over here, the preload is basically, if the heart cannot function properly, will the blood back up, yes or no? For example, if the ventricle is not functioning properly, will the blood back up over here, yes or no? The answer is yes. As a result, the pressure in the left atria, will it be high or will it be low? The pressure in the left atria is going to be high, right? So in majority of the cases, preload is also high due to blood accumulation, due to accumulation of the blood, okay? Next one, cardiac output, will it be high or will it be low? Cardiac output is going to be low. Afterload, high or low? Afterload is going to be high. Okay, good, very good. Next one is obstructive shock. If we have any sort of obstruction where the heart cannot uh, pump the blood out properly, for example, if the obstruction is due to cardiac, cardiac tamponade, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, then once again, there will be less stretching of the bare receptors and sympathetic innervation will result in a cold, clammy skin. And blood will accumulate in the left atrium one more time. So it could be, preload could be high or sometimes it could be low, but majority of the time it's high. After load is going to be high or low. After load is going to be high. Mm -hmm. Cardiac output is going to be low. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay, last one. Distributive shock. That is in sepsis, anaphylaxis, and these conditions. So what would happen in sepsis and aphylaxis? In these conditions, do we have excessive release of cytokines and mediators? The answer is yes. Do they cause vasodilatation? The answer is yes. If there's vasodilatation, can, will the skin be warm or will the skin be cold? The skin will be warm. Afterload will be low, excessively low. Why? Because vasodilatation will decrease total peripheral resistance. As a result, cardiac output, cardiac output will be high because it's easier for the heart to pump the blood out. If the cardiac output is high, there's less blood uh, accumulating in the left atrium. So preload is also going to be low, okay? Preload is going to be low. Are we clear, yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, so very quickly, I'm gonna give you guys exactly five minutes. I'm gonna give you guys five minutes. Please read this and then I'm gonna quiz you and I'm gonna move forward, okay? Please try to remember the distributive shock. CNS injury, we sort, we sort of have a mildly uh, different presentation. In CNS injury for distributive shock, since we have loss of CNS injury, we have loss of, um, basically we have, uh, we, we have decreased sympathetic activity, which results in decreased cardiac output. That's the only difference between sepsis and CNS injury for distributive shock, okay? So do not read the treatments. I'll talk about the treatments later read the findings of over up to here. I'm going to give you five minutes and then I'm going to ask you questions, okay? It's 11.10. I'm going to ask you at 11.15. You have exactly five minutes to go to the table. Thank you so much.
Okay, uh, we have a very good question over here from Dr. S. That is, uh, any, is there any difference between the cardiogenic shock and the obstructive shock? The answer is, um, the answer is uh, that over here, that the findings of cardiogenic and obstructive shock are more or less the same, but the sign symptoms of the patient of cardiogenic shock and obstructive shock will be very different. Patients of cardiogenic shock will come to you with sign symptoms of heart failure, Patients of obstructive shock will come to you with sign symptoms of uh, the underlying disorder. For example, for cardiac tamponade, they will come to you with sign symptoms of Beck's triad, right? For jugular venous dis distension, muffled heart sound, hypotension. For pulmonary embolism, they will come to you with sign symptoms of sudden onset of severe chest pain and shortness of breath. For tension pneumothorax, patients will come to you with a history of either a trauma or recent surgery, or the build of the patient will be tall and uh, thin and skinny. As a result, they will have a sudden onset of severe shortness of breath, and there will be a hyper-resonant breath sound and everything else. So that's the only difference. Okay. Okay, Dr. Otero was also kind enough to write a little bit about the difference in the chat box. If you guys are interested, please check it out. Now, are you guys done, yes or no? Are you guys done reading the shock or did you guys take a break? What about neurogenic shock? What about neurogenic shock? What about, well, like, are you asking why neurogenic shock is not here? Yes. I mean, yes, it will affect the, um, the CVS, the cardiovascular like system or circulation. Right. So the thing is, the neurogenic shock, that portion of the discussion, uh, I'll conduct it in CNS, central nervous system. So that portion of the shock is basically there in uh, the CNS. So we'll talk about it over there. But if I have to talk about neurogenic shock very quickly, then what is neurogenic shock? Neurogenic shock is basically when we have a sudden cessation of all the nervous impulses and nerve transmission through the uh, different nerves of the body. As a result, will we have loss of cardiac function? The answer is yes, because sympathetic, sympathetic activity will not be there. So uh, then, then, then what else? As a result, cardiac output is going to be low. After load over here will also be low because uh, there will be loss of chronicity and uh, preload could be high because of the accumulation of blood in the left atrium of the low cardiac output. So that's that. What are some of the causes of neurogenic shock, sudden severe trauma? recent surgery, in fact, uh, not infection, injury, right? As a sudden severe injury and, and all of these conditions. So we'll talk about neurogenic shock in the CNS, but for now, please focus on uh, these four shocks, okay? Are we clear? Did we read about the shocks? Yes or no? Can we move forward? Yes, okay, good. What are the treatments for the different sorts of shock? Now over here, for hypovolemic shock, what are you going to give? For hypovolemic shock, what are you going to give to the patient? Fluids, yes or no? Okay, good. For cardiogenic shock, what are you going to give to the patient? Basically, for cardiogenic shock, the heart cannot pump the blood out. So we have to give diuretics, ACE or ARB and inotropes. Very good. For obstructive shock, where we have cardiac tamponade, pulmonary embolism, tension pneumothorax, are we going to relieve the obstruction? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Just give me one second. Okay, for obstructive shock, right? If we have an obstructive shock, uh, the treatment is very simple. If a patient has obstruction due to cardiac tamponade, pulmonary embolism, or tension pneumothorax, should we just relieve the obstruction? Yes or no? For example, for cardiac tamponade, what do we do? Do we do a pericardiosynthesis or a pericardial window? The answer is yes. 
for pulmonary embolism, what do we do? Do we do a CT or MR and geography and remove the tamponade? Yes or no? The answer is yes. For tension pneumothorax, what do we do? Do we make um, do we make a one-way valve in the second right, second intercostal space to relieve the uh, to relieve all the air? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So that's the that's the mechanism of treatment. So the treatment is relieve the obstruction. As simple as that. Next one is distributive shock. Distributive shock is simply due to what sepsis and anaphylaxis. So if there's sepsis and anaphylaxis, what do we do? We give IV fluids. We give epinephrine. <clears throat> epinephrine so that there is vascular contraction and vascular tone. And number two is in sepsis, we can give antibiotics and all the other things. Yes or no? Okay. Are we clear? Okay. Uh, who was the physician who asked about neurogenic shock? CNS injury is a type of neurogenic shock, by the way. Okay, these are the findings you'll see in a neurogenic shock. Okay, good. So that's that, that's about it. Uh, can we take a quick break before we finish cardiac pathology today? Yes or no? Okay, how long do you guys wanna take the break for? 10 minutes or 15 minutes? 15 minutes. Can I get some feedback from the rest of the students, please? 15 minutes out. So let's take a break for 15 minutes and then after our break, let's come back and finish cardiac pathology today, okay? Tomorrow we will finish pharmacology and then we will begin our um, next system, okay? So let's take a break for 15 minutes, it's 11.20. We'll begin at 11.35. Yes, reproductive. There you go. Okay. So thank you so much. I'll see you guys in 15 minutes.
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Yes, hello. Is everyone back from the break? Yes, okay, good. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so let's begin today's lecture. Uh, after the break, we're gonna start talking about cardiac tamponade. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Yes, okay. so let's begin now. Let's start talking about cardiac tamponade. What is cardiac tamponade? So first and foremost, we are aware that um, we're aware that the heart is surrounded by a cavity. Yes or no? The heart is surrounded by a cavity, right? So that's that. For any reason. If we have, for any reason, if there is a rupture of the cardiac walls, right? For any reason, if there is a rupture of cardiac walls, can we have blood that leaks out from the cardiac wall and start accumulating in the pericardial space? Several. So the answer is yes. So the blood will start accumulating in the pericardial space. If the blood starts accumulating in the pericardial space, will the heart have enough space to contract and relax? Yes or no? The answer is no. Another one is, another one is, um, let's say that there is no problem with the heart muscles. Let's say that we have fluid, one second, please. My apologies. Now, let's say that there is no problem with the heart muscle, right? But let's say that instead of blood accumulating into the space, what if we have accumulation of pleural fluid or pleural effusion into the pericardial space? Pleural fluid or pleural effusion? Isn't that a possibility? Yes or no? For example, um, my, my apologies. What I mean is if we have accumulation of, let's say um, there is some sort of leakage of fluid, for example, an esophageal perforation. Can we have an accumulation of fluid then if there's esophageal perforation? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. But what is the most common cause of cardiac tamponade? The, the most common cause of cardiac tamponade is if there's a break in the cardiac walls and blood leaks out and blood accumulates over here. So now next one, if the blood accumulates over here, the right ventricle, can it contract properly? Yes or no? right ventricle can it contract properly the answer is no if it doesn't contract properly will enough blood go to the go to the lungs the answer is no that must mean that blood is not coming back to the left atrium and, and into the left ventricle as a result the pressure with which the left ventricle will push the blood out will the pressure be high or the pressure be low the answer is the pressure will be low so patients will they have hypertension or hypotension the answer is patients who have high tension. Number one. Number two is all this blood accumulating over here, will this put pressure in the right atrium? Yes or no? The answer is yes. As a result, will there be jugular venous distension? Yes or no? Distension to the jugular vein? Yes or no? Fast chances, please. The answer is yes. So there will be jugular venous distension. Another one, all this um, blood that's accumulating in the cardiac space. If we try to auscultate the heart sound, right? If we try to auscultate the heart sound with our stethoscope, can we get muffling of the heart sound? Yes or no? Muffled heart sound means 
that the heart sounds are not clear, unclear heart sound because of the sound has to travel through all this fluid and then has to be transmitted through the stethoscope. The heart sounds are going to be muffled. So we will say muffled heart sound, muffled heart sound. So patients will come with these sign symptoms I mean, these sorts of examination and the findings of these three things together is called what triad they are called dex triad okay very good so if you have a patient who comes to you with a history of trauma most of the patients of cardiac tamponade will have a history of trauma or they can have history of radiation or chemotherapy or esophageal perforation or anything and they come to you with sudden onset of chest pain, shortness of breath. And you, you see in examination, the patients have hypotension, jugular venous distension, and muffled heart sound. Your clinical diagnosis is cardiac tamponade. After that, what do we do? After that, we will do an EKG. Yes or no? We will do an EKG. And EKG, what do we find? We find that over here, in EKG, we find that the electricity will look like this. Can we say that this is an alternative pattern, alternating electricity? Right? Every alternate, it, it either increases or decreases. In, increases or decreases. Increases or decreases. This type of electricity is called electrical alterance. Are we clear? Yes or no? This is called electrical alterance. And will there will this be a high voltage or a low voltage fat sizes? The answer is this will be a low voltage. Why? Because all the compression around the heart over here will compress on the nodes and they will not be able to transmit the impulse. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Another physical examination is that these patients, they will have pulses paradoxes. They will have pulses paradoxes. What is pulse? What is pulses paradoxes? Pulses paradoxes is that over here, when we take a deep breath, right? When we take a deep breath during inspiration, normally what happens is when we take a deep breath during inspiration, there is a drop of systolic blood pressure more than I mean, there's a drop of systolic blood pressure around of 10 millimeters of mercury. Can anyone tell me why? Whenever we take a deep breath, there is increase of intrathoracic pressure. And that usually, that usually compresses on the physiological heart. And the heart is not able to pump blood as efficiently as it does when we are expiring. But that's normal. That's a normal decrease in blood pressure. But already, if there's a compression around the heart like this, and you are taking a deep breath, isn't it possible that the systolic blood pressure can fall below 10 millimeters of mercury? Yes or no, when we, during inspiration? The answer is yes. So as a result, if the systolic blood pressure falls below, I mean, I mean, if it falls more than 10 millimeters of mercury during inspiration, this phenomenon is called what? Can anyone tell me very quickly, please? This, this phenomenon is called? Pulses paradoxes. Thank you so much. Can I get some fast feedbacks from the rest of the students? Please, I'd really appreciate it so that I can finish the topic. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Next one is, what are some of the other diseases where we see pulses paradoxes? What are some of the other diseases where we see pulses paradoxes? Number one is, very good. Thank you so much. Asthma. Does anyone have any else idea? Asthma, then if asthma, then COPD should also be there, right? And then what else? Cardiac tamponade. We just talked about it. Okay. There's another uh, viral disease called croup. Right. Very good. Another one is obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea. Okay. So these are the five diseases where we see pulses paradoxes. Okay. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay. Now, let me see if you guys have understood the lecture. Can I get the attention of, okay, who can unmute themselves and, and answer questions? Please write me in the chat box if you are a confident student. Who can unmute themselves and answer questions regarding cardiac tamponade? Anyone? 
if you make mistakes, that's better for you because you will learn. If you do not participate in the active participations, then very good, Dr. Hayvar, thank you so much for helping us out. Okay, so would you mind unmuting yourself? What is the yes. primary cause of cardiac tamponade, please? What are what? What is the primary cause of cardiac tamponade? Um, anything do uh, compression for of the heart, uh, like uh, if there is any hemorrhage around in the pericardium or um, there is a fusion, anything um, uh, prevent the heart from expanding. Can you guys hear my voice, yes or no? Okay, give me one second. Okay, uh, doc, I think Dr. Dahlia is the host for some reason. I'm not sure how, <laughs> okay. This has never happened before. Um, is there a possibility, Dr. H Dr. Dahlia, you can uh, shift the host from yourself to myself, yes or no, from yourself to me? Yeah, I see me, my the host. I don't know how to do this. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Wait, just give me one second. This has never happened to me before. I'm not really sure how you became the host. <clears throat> are, yeah, are, you trying to, are you trying to hack our system and take our passwords, Dr. Dahlia? Yes. Is that your big plan, Dr. Dahlia? No. So let's see how we can fix this problem. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, Dahlia, best. Mungkin tadgati shifti fil isim hakik tagi hadis ma mor. Is it possible for you to log yeah, out? More. Bin or rename, just I see bin or rename. I'm not sure. 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 I'm not s
Yes, Dr. Dahlia, please try to listen to what your friend is saying and please make, make me the host again. I'm not really sure how you became the host. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay can, I, can I log out and? Yeah, if you try logging out, let me see if that works or not. If you try logging out, let me see if I become the host then. Uh, uh, I don't see log out, I see just end. <laughs> okay, end, end and then come back. Oh, if you end, then the meeting will be over. Yeah. Uh, okay, how about this? How about, you know what? Let me send you guys another uh, Zoom meeting invitation. Okay, let me, okay. May, maybe that will work. So, so everyone, please check your email right away. Okay. And I'm going to send you another uh, link and then we'll join there. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.